Okay, so I have a, another story about um, an ice addict and his penis. Oh, yes, please. From my nurse friend. So um, she was at, uh, in, working in the ER and urology is like, oh, girl, <laughs> you got to come have a look at this. <laughs> this guy did some ice and he had a massive erection for four days. <gasps> and the, And <gasps> all during that time, he uh, was wanking. Oh, and for he four days. he wanked all the skin off his <gasps> penis. Oh my <gasps> god! What I'm what? imagining, like just ripping it off. Ripping off his penis. Yeah. He, but but there was nothing left, guys. <gasps> it was just like the like the urethra like must <gasps> just be like I'm not sure if he was circumcised, but there's, there was no foreskin left. There was like oh my god, <laughs> there's nothing left. I don't know what they're gonna. do. Do what the to fix oh, that? I didn't know that was possible. <gasps> oh my god! So I've been very late to the party and indulging in ice. Uh, true blood. <laughs> oh, no, <okay>. ice. <laughs> true blood for the for like like probably a decade too late. I love anyway. true blood. Excellent yeah. show. It's so good. That this reminds me because there is a scene in season one where Jason Stackhouse takes V and he gets a raging boner for like three days. Yep. Yes. And he literally does that to himself. Oh yep. my god, I forgot all about that. I was just thinking of a mate of mine who has um snapped his banjo string multiple times. <laughs> no, no, not me. Time. What do you mean multiple times? Why don't they just circumcise him and have it be done? Well, because the, the, the banjo, banjo string is a good it's supposed to be there. That's not what's taken. That's not what's removed. Oh, sorry. Yeah. As no. far as I know, this is the frenulum that's underneath the head of the penis. If anyone doesn't know what a banjo string is. Um, so basically so one funny. time was a shower screen and another time was with a <gasps> sexual partner and they just left. He was like bleeding out and he's like, I think I have to go to the hospital. They're like, I'm busy. They just couldn't deal with it at all. <laughs> I'm busy. <laughs> oh my just God. left. <laughs> you can sort your, yeah, you, you see that like horrible wound on your genitalia. You can sort that self. You You'll be off. fine. I'm like, I've got to go. See ya. Fucking hell. Well, <laughs> with that image in your head, welcome listeners to The Weird Sisters, a podcast about the blurs, the bizarre, and literally everything you are happier and not knowing about. My name is Tay, and your mother sucks cocks in hell. Oh, that's lovely. My mom <laughs> had a birthday party for a dog this week. Um, my name is Laura, <laughs> and I am the phallic foreshadowing looming in the background. Oh. And I'm Lacey, and I want to see what your insides look like. Oh. Why do you sound like an old witch when you say that? <laughs> because he is an old witch. Oh, it's a direct like quote, it. my dude. We always sound like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is true. That's why I made the podcast, Laura. <laughs> well, get with the program. Yeah, sh- okay. Sh- yes. <laughs> well, our theme this week is uh, cursed movies, movie lore, behind the scenes, BTS, not the K-pop band. Hello. Um, <gasps> BTS. Yes. I always read it as behind the scenes and then I realize someone's talking about their 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 stand oh uh, the k-pop group yeah and I'm like okay I'm old <laughs> anyway <clears throat> uh we've got three stories for you this week uh a little bit of movie magic um and first up is me me naturally Laura. me most important hey, take it away. <laughs> um so I'd like to open with watch curse films on shutter Oh my goodness. It is such a good TV series. Tay and I have already like briefly spoken about this because she has also watched one of the episodes and I made her not watch any other ones. <laughs> yes. I was a, I was a good I was a good girl. <sighs> it's so good. It's so good. I don't know like I started studying film in the last 2 years um and before that I had like no interest in studying film, but all this cool background stuff on horror films is amazing and super weird and really fucked mm-hmm. up. And Cursed Films does the best job of covering it. There's going to be a season two out, I believe, this year. Um, get Shutter. Oh, yes. Purely bitch. to watch Cursed Films. It is so, so good. So moving on from that, I have decided to do a little little five-part listicle for you. We're going to go into five films where people fucking died making them on set. Yes, bitch. Yes. <gasps> yes. It is very, oh, there's a lot. There's a lot going on here. Some of them you may know. I tried to go for ones that people didn't know, though. 
So, have either of you heard of the film They Died With Their Boots On? Heard of, yes. Yep. I I know that there is a um, <laughs> sidebar nation, but I know that there is a, a witchy shop in Salem with that name. Oh, yes, there is. I have also actually looked at their <gasps> website in the last couple of months. I keep seeing them pop There's up. There's some the good email. shit like, there. Why? Who is this? Oh. Mm. When the when the world is not a huge steaming trash pile, um, we should do a pod trip to Salem. Yes. Oh, a pilgrimage God. to Salem, but only the during the month there. of October. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> of course. Perfect. Um, For Samhain. Yes. Yes. Well, anyway. Carry on. Ignoring the witch shop. This movie is a 1941 black and white western that was directed by Raoul Walsh. So it stars Errol Flynn, who was a very, very famous Australian actor in the golden age of Hollywood. Um, and his son went missing. <gasps> he did. He did. He went missing in like the Vietnam. <laughs> um, he was a photojournalist and they never found him. It's very sad. Oh, God, that's spooky. Very yep. spooky. Um, and it also stars Olivia de Halavand, who was another extremely famous actor. Um, they were often paired together in the 40s as like leading lady and leading man. Um, and they had a very interesting career together because like it was very obvious that there was a lot of tension between them but apparently they never never did anything together Mm. anyway moving on um so this movie depicts the career of general george armstrong custer uh and it ends with custer's last stand which you may have heard of um it was a thing that happened in uh, the oh my god uh what's the confederate war what was that oh the civil yes, war yes yes, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> bad history um but this movie Shit. is super fictionalized and completely riddled with inaccuracies but it was made in the 40s so who cares um, yep. <laughs> i'm joking by the way it's a very nice film but uh basically because of new union laws at the time producers decided to use extras who had no stunt experience because from what i can tell they would have had to have paid them extra um so during the filming of the last stand sequence which happens right at the very end of the film there's around about 200 horsemen charging around pretending to have a battle with each other Uh yeah it was so dangerous that during one day of filmmaking anthony quinn who played a uh character called crazy horse um arranged as a gag (laughs) for a hearse to show up at the filming location (laughs) oh he played crazy horse yes he did um just, a, just gag. a gag, just a gag. But incidentally, three men were killed filming this scene, and eighty people were injured. Yeah. Oh, <gasps> fuck. Yeah. Right. Fucking hell. Horses and filming men. Oh, dude, yeah. I don't even want to know how many horses would have died on set because if eighty people were injured and three people died, and that's what's recorded, how yeah. many fucking horses like just smashed into each other, broke their legs, and had to get put down? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of horses died on Lord of the Rings. Oh, did they really? Oh, yeah. Really sadly. Really sad. It was yeah. sad because they were, you know, people's horses. They were pets. Yeah. <sighs> but um, actually, the like they go, they put the horses through like a boot camp so that they would be fine with loud noises. And basically, it's like a, a haunted house that you ride your horse through, <laughs> and it's got like little, <laughs> and like people like you swing your sword and there's like noises and things like that. And the horses don't give a fuck. Like it's so desensitized <laughs> <laughs> by the haunted house, horsey haunted house. <laughs> Well, these horses did not go through the haunted house, clearly. Oh. Um, so the first first guy, first man, uh, was drunk, supposedly. His name was George Murphy, um, and he had no experience riding a horse. He broke his neck falling from the horse. <gasps> oh, shit. Yep. Uh, a... Me trying to get on a horse. <laughs> <laughs> One of huh. the other um, stuntmen, I say this in air quotations, Bill Mead, um, he suffered a fatal heart attack on set during this filming. <gasps> and the third death was a guy called Jack Budlong. He was a personal friend of Errol Flynn's, um, our leading man. Apparently he badgered Flynn so much about getting into this film. He really, really wanted to be in this movie um, that Flynn just gave in and was like, put this man on a horse. <laughs> they played polo together and Budlong was actually an excellent horseman but he wanted to use a real saber to lead his cavalry in the big battle scene. Oh, yeah. So the horses that had not really been put through the haunted house experience uh, spooked the fuck out at all the stunt explosions. Um, It bucked Bud Long off his, basically bucked him off, and he impaled himself on his sword. 
<gasps> he tried to fall away from with it away from him, but the hilt got wedged between two rocks and went straight through him. Holy oh, shit! What? God. What a fucking idiot for a start. But also, like, what are the odds of the the one dude yeah. that's like, I want to use a real saber? It's like, all right, dickhead. There's use no it. way that would like fly today. Oh fuck no! The forties was all. a very different time in Hollywood. Uh-huh. But yeah, very interesting. So that's that's our first film. Now we move on to Triple X. Oh, oh my god! god. What? Oh my god. Right? What? With Vin Diesel? Yes, with Vin Diesel. My man. Twenty twenty. Uh, oh. Twenty. Mm. The 2002, not 20, <laughs> I don't know how to say years anymore, um, spy film with Vin Diesel directed by Rob Cohen. So Diesel did a lot of his own stunts in this film um, and he took a fall during the avalanche scene. I actually haven't seen this film, so I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Oh, I, I have because I was obsessed with Vin Diesel for a time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. This was great. Love, love, love. Mm. Um, mm. But he landed head first in the snow and, like, wasn't moving. And Cohen was really <gasps> fucking worried that like, basically he'd murdered Vin Diesel. Um, but the stunts in this film sound insane. And there's a point where, like, they basically were like, no, Diesel. that We're going to we're gonna get real stuntmen to do this shit. So there's a scene where Diesel's character is parasailing behind a boat on a waterway in Prague. Do either of you remember this? Yes. Okay, so yep. just before the boat passes beneath a bridge, Diesel's character repels down the cable that connects the parasail to the boat and gets out of the way. In reality, on April 4th, 2002, on the second take of the stunt, Diesel's double, 45-year-old uh, Harry O'Connor, hit the bridge, instantly killed. <gasps> Splat, really? Yeah, straight away. Apparently it oh. broke his neck. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, and you can actually... <laughs> There's a clip oh. on YouTube with Rob Cohen's commentary over the top. I found sources that said that they used part of that take in the film oh. and other sources that said, no, they didn't. So I'm not sure Ooh. what the fuck happened there. Allegedly. But it's kind of fucked up. Um, I will give the link over to uh, our, our, fo- uh, the, 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 our show notes um, so you can see that if you want to. But hearing Cohen's commentary is kind of fucked up. Like. There's an article called um, The Director's Cut by Bruce Orwell who interviewed Rob Cohen about the DVD for The Fast and the Furious. And the second to last paragraph of this article basically talks about how Cohen was already planning for the DVD of Triple X to have the commentary and be like a documentary and he wanted to be trailed everywhere by a cameraman. And this reads, This time he wants to be even bolder in capturing moments of drama on set, especially the crew's reaction to the film's progressively more daring stunts. Cohen said, I want to capture the night when a stuntman couldn't do it, when he was too afraid to do it. So this kind of implies that Cohen's a fucking asshole trying to make stunts more and more dangerous to the point that stuntmen would be like, no, no one should do this. Even yeah. though obviously if you're in a big budget film like Triple X, something with Vin Diesel in it, um, you're going to want to be in it. You don't want to get cut. You don't want to tell the director no because there is an implicit yeah. like – hierarchy of power when you work on any kind of film or any kind of production Mm -hmm. like this so basically there's some concerns there that Cohen kind of accidentally orchestrated well not even accidentally orchestrated the death of one of his stuntmen by being a fucking asshole about how dangerous he wanted it to be that's kind of like you have a duty of care yeah Yeah, right (laughs) exactly exactly like there's some um stunt performers that won't do stair falls yeah because you can't really predict the fact that this guy was going to – is, like, paraglides into the thing mm-hmm. is crazy. Yeah. It's crazy to me. Oh it's my super God. upsetting. This list is filled with some shit about directors that I'm like, holy fucking shit. Mm. But mm. moving right along, we have <laughs> the 1969 film Shark! Exclamation point. Shark! 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 <laughs> um, <Blush. laughs> exactly. So this stars Burt Reynolds uh, and was directed by Sam Fuller. Um, this this is super gross. The producers actually changed the name of the film in order to capitalize on the death that occurred during filming. <gasps> right? That's fucked up. So fucked up. Oh, fucked up as. Okay. So um, basically while filming, uh, Jose Marco, a stuntman and body double for Reynolds, was attacked and killed on camera by a subdued. I don't know what that means. Does that mean like a tranquilized? Anyway, bullshit. Probably they're like they're. Yeah, um, he <gasps> a was bull shark. a bull shark. He was disemboweled while cameras were rolling, and which prompted a photo spread in Life magazine. 
<gasps> yep. Do those photos exist? I couldn't find them. Like there's a lot oh. of film that I saw. I don't know. Some of the like photos I have seen, but I don't know if they're like film props, if it's real. Finding information about mm-hmm. this is quite difficult. Um, but some of it was very fucked up. So according to Life magazine, um, Marco was filming alongside the subdued bull shark in scuba gear uh, when the, basically it managed to make it through the nets, protecting the area from the rest of the sea and charged at the camera crew. Mm. So the shark had before this been dragged onto the shore with the aim of making it distressed to get better footage, which is all kinds of fucked oh. up as well. Like I know this was, it was the, 60s, the end of yeah. the 60s, but still, <laughs> yeah. come on, my dude, like some kind of animal protection. Was it Jose Marco? Yes. So oh, his death She's Googling. was used <laughs> in the marketing material. Like on film it posters is. and stuff, they promoted it. They were like, one man died while filming it. It's fucking awful. Um, his poor family. Right. Right. Did they compensate the family? I could not yeah, find anything not. about that. No. But considering that they what they did, I would say no. Mm. Um, no. So crew members tried to steer not. the shark away from Marco with spears, but the animal basically didn't give a fuck. Um, stuntman's injuries were so severe and so catastrophic that he died basically as he was being transported to hospital. Um, Who producers wanted to and ultimately did use footage of Marco's death in the film, along with publicizing <gasps> the incident as a marketing push. Oh my god! What? I'm yeah. That's fucked up. Oh. Um, the director Sam Fuller, I do want to say, he was disgusted and he totally disavowed the movie. He really wanted to remove his name from the credits, but he was unsuccessful in doing that. Um, no. Marco was 32 when he died. I've just sent you ah. through the promo shoot in the chat. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that's what I also saw. It's the black and oh my god red. like it's yeah. legit it's fucking got oh i can't believe that. yeah it's really so upsetting bad. life magazine's fucked up for doing that too um yep. <laughs> so okay fourth film uh the messenger which i'm going to assume neither of you have heard of this is a russian film mm, okay no, yeah no. so it's another 2002 film same as our xander cage um <laughs> basically <laughs> it was starring and written by 30 year old uh sergey bodrov jr um, he was filming in the Caucasus Mountains on the 20th of September in 2002 when at approximately 7 p.m. they stopped filming due to poor lighting conditions. For unknown reasons, I could not find anything anyway. Uh, it was really, again, difficult to find information on this, weirdly enough. Part of the Kolka Glacier collapsed in the mountains they were working in. Oh, no. <laughs> it spurred a massive rock and ice slide. Um, a block of ice fell from the Jamara, the Jamara, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, Mountain onto the Kolka ice flow, bringing with it mud and boulders. The mud flow totally covered the Karmadon Ravine, which is where the film crew were working, and two villages. Oh, my God. It buried the villages in up to 500 feet of ice and debris. Um, a massive search and rescue, op- uh, rescue operation basically proved totally fruitless. 135 people in total were killed, 27 of the cast and crew included, including <gasps> Bordorov. Holy shit. Right? Did they spit up? <laughs> well. Was that in poor taste? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I don't know, but I couldn't find it out. But it didn't seem from what I read like anyone actually was found at all. Like I don't think they found oh, many that's... survivors, if any. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's awful. What? A, that's just a freak accident right? too. It's, it's fucking insane. I don't know why the mountain collapsed. Um Considering there were two villages on this ice flow area, you kind of would assume it's relatively unusual for it to collapse that way, but Mm. fucking hell. Sad. But we have come to our fifth and final film. The Twilight Zone, the movie. Ooh. (gasps) Yes. Yes, bitch. Did you watch an episode for this? No, but I know what this is. Okay. Excellent. Lacey, do you know anything about this? No. Oh my god, oh, this is so oh, fuck. fucking awful. I never know what the thing is. I never know. You what know the what thing the thing is. is. And I know what this thing is. <laughs> Take it away, my love. Okay. Yes. Okay. So 1982. I should be cheering. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. This is really fucking. Hmm. Yeah. It's a good thing that I'm going first. You guys have to lighten the mood after this. Yeah. Well, 1982. Uh, Horror anthology film uh, directed and produced by John Landis and Steven Spielberg. The big big buddies back in the day. Um so it's basically 
if you know anything about Twilight Zone, they were like episodes of um, short horror films. Uh, so the movie was basically four episodes of the original series, three makes, remakes of existing episodes and one entirely new story. Uh, each episode or segment of the film had a different director. John Landis directed both a short prologue and the first episode. Uh, I don't know if I have you, either of you ever seen the prologue for this film. It's kind of famous. You might have seen it online. It's like a guy, two guys driving along a highway in like a desert scenario and um, they're talking about like scary horror films. And then one guy's like, do you want to see something really scary? And then when the other guy's like, yeah, yeah, I do. He uh, basically turns around, hides his face and he turns back. He's a monster and he eats dude. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so that's from this film. So Landis directed that, and then he was also directing a uh, short that was basically about a guy who is racist and gets, like, sent back in time to different eras uh, where the people he's been racist, well, the minorities he's been racist against um, had experienced extreme prejudice, so, like, the Holocaust and things like that. Um, And then he's forced to, like, live it out and see what those people would have experienced in those times. Mm. So... An elaborate set was built to look like a Vietnamese village beside a river. Um, from memory, I believe it was looking at the um, Vietnam War that America. I can't remember anything today, and I haven't written anything down. I'm so sorry. I sound like a fucking idiot. Mate, <laughs> nah, thanks until you make it. But it's I believe fine. you it's are fine. correct. Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> the scene where the protagonist, who is played by Vic Morrow, he grabs two little kids, Renee Shin Yi Chen and Micah Din Lee. They are aged six and seven. And he runs away from the helicopter, which is firing at the village that is in this scene. So the kids were actually hired illegally and paid under the table. Uh, Californian law does not allow children to work at night. And the kids were, kids were actually hidden from inspectors. They knew 100% that they shouldn't be doing this for children at this time of night in this kind of scene. The parents were Excellent. even told about a lot of, like, what was going on in the scene. They didn't know that there would be fake explosions. They didn't know that there would be, like, a lot going on um, in this scene, which is insane. So on the 23rd of July, 1982, at 2.30 a.m., Moreau has Renee and Micah under each arm. He is running through knee-deep water as the helicopter, a a big fucking helicopter, a real helicopter, hovers 25 feet, which is about 7.6 metres, directly above them. As the helicopter... Mm -hmm. Hel- helicopter helicopter rotated for an alternative camera shot one of the explosions was de- detonated directly beneath the tail rotor <gasps> the tail rotor failed oh and broke off the helicopter immediately lost control and spun out simultaneously moro dropped renee as he reached out to grab her the helicopter crashed down on top of them renee was crushed between the helicopter's right landing skid Morrow and Micah were decapitated by the rotor blades. All three died instantly. Both families were present and watching the scene being filmed. Isn't that truly fucking cool? It's oh my so god. horrific. Like, yeah. so awful. Oh my god. So, so How awful. old were these? The kids were six and seven years old. Fucking hell. And their families were literally watching the whole thing. Mm. Abs- it's awful. It's so now, awful. How I found out about that was I was on a Reddit deep dive on Ask Reddit that was like, what's the most fucked up thing you've ever seen? <gasps> oh, no. Someone saw and the I, footage and you saw the footage? I I didn't see the footage because oh, I just like to read about the things. <laughs> yep. And if I deem myself uh, with enough of a stomach and enough balls, I will watch it. And I didn't watch that <laughs> one. But everyone underneath was like, oh, I came here to say this. I came. It was like one of the highest. Like, oh, yeah, places. of course. It's yeah. so, Yeah. <laughs> Um, Cursed Films does cover this. Um, they do show some of the footage. They obviously don't show the footage um, from memory anyway. I watched this a couple of months back. But that episode is really, really intense. Like I'm pretty sure I was bawling while trying to pack to come to Perth um, just <laughs> watching this episode. Like, Because <sighs> it, it's, hor- uh, it's horrific and it gets worse and worse as they go throughout the episode because – so this is like the rest that I was going to tell you. Um, Dan Alligham, who was on board the helicopter, told the pilot, that's too much, let's get out of here, when the explosions were detonated. But Landis, the director, shouted over the radio, get lower, lower, get over, lower. <gasps> Robinson said, These 
fucking, I fucking know. Um, so Robinson said that the pilot tried to leave the area, but that we lost control and regained and regained it. And then I could feel something let go, and we began spinning around in circles. So no one on board yeah. the helico- uh, helicopter actually was um, killed by it, but they were injured. Uh, Stephen Lidecker, who was also a camera operator on board, testified that Landis had earlier shrugged off warnings about the stunt with the comment, we may lose a helicopter. Not thinking about the seven metres below, three actors, two children who were completely in danger and the people on board the fucking helicopter. Like, that's so fucked up to me. It's awful. So awful. Um, yeah. Spielberg actually ended his friendship with Landis over the incident. It was like 10 years of court drama um, going on back and forth about whether or not, who was in the wrong, what happened, blah, blah, blah. Um, Spielberg basically said, no movie is worth dying for. I think people are standing up more and more now than now more than ever before producers and directors who ask for too much. If something isn't safe, it's the right and responsibility of every actor and crew member to yell cut. Oh, my God. Yeah. So this is like basically ended a kind of second golden age of Hollywood. Like there was a director, a, the, like Spielberg and all these other like, young directors who'd gone to film school together around the same time, like Tarantino and all these kind of boys, um, they basically had come together in film school with this idea of authorship which is where a film is a vision of one person, the director. Um, And you see that a lot in like Wes Anderson films. It looks like a Wes Anderson film. Tarantino films, you know it's a fucking Tarantino film. Woody Allen. Yeah, Yeah, Woody Allen. All of those kind of boys um, all went into film school with this idea of authorship. So that kind of like there's some theories about how it gave these directors this idea that it was their baby they were in charge everyone had to do what they want them to do and it still kind of persists now with directors like director is god um yeah so this sort of ended a lot of that this incident was so horrific so intense and was so publicized that like spielberg and a lot of others were like we shouldn't be given this power of responsibility we don't know everything we're not able to take care of everything a lot of people who are directing films don't even have like basic safety training no (laughs) yeah um so yeah those are my five films uh i did not talk about a couple like brandon lee dying in the crow um i oh, thought yeah. that that was something that we a lot of people know about um also it is in the cursed films uh episodes i would highly Ooh. recommend cursed films go watch it on shutter it's so good it does cover brandon lee in the crow um and a bunch of other ones that are really fantastic 100 percent Mate, I'm into it. Thank you. Perfect. I hope you enjoyed. For oh, what an icebreaker! I Yay. love it. <laughs> well, I'm up next, <clears throat> and I have just a single cursed film for you. So, uh, my film is The Exorcist. Uh, of, of, as you may or may not know, depending how long you've been listening to our little show, um, I love The Exorcist. It is one of my favorite films. I watched it far too young. Far too early, far too close to my formative years. Um, a little recap. I, um, My stepfather I was very close with him growing up and he was very, he was very good to me. He never sugarcoated anything, never like bullshitted me, spoke to me like an adult. And I used to like come to him with any questions. I'm like, hey, hey, dad, what's like? what's this? Or like, I come, he's like, oh, how was school? I'm like, oh, we had sex ed today. And we talked about like masturbation. He's like, yeah, what, so what, what of it? Like, just like shit like that. Like very, (laughs) spoke to me like, yeah, you're, yeah. (laughs) Like just shit like that. And he, and I remember, yeah, just like, and then like, I remember just shit like that. And like, I remember being in uh, Kmart (laughs) in their DVD (laughs) section and I remember seeing the cover of The Exorcist and I'm like, Dad, what's that? And he picks it up and he goes, we're going to buy it and we're going to watch yeah. this. <laughs> I was 12. Amazing. <laughs> Potentially just shy of 13. I think I was either in grade six or in year seven. Um, around this time as well, we started because he, again, mentioned it before, um, he was a huge Tarantino fan. Um, I watched Pulp Fiction way too young. Um, and we used to, and he worked a lot. So on the weekends when he had like a spare afternoon, he'd be like, let's watch a movie. 
And so we had like a movie, a couple of months long, like a movie festival. And we watched Pulp Fiction. We watched Deliverance. <laughs> we watched The Exorcist. We watched Romper Stomper. Oh Romper Stomper. Shit. All very close together. So that was that was my childhood. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. No. And I'm very, very thankful for it because I feel like I have a I have the weakest stomach of the three of us, I think. But at the same time, I have a concrete stomach compared to the normal fucking humans. Well, so. I don't know. This is and subjective because Lacey can watch popping videos and that makes me want to hurl every time. I hate <laughs> them. But I can watch, like, people getting pulled apart, decapitated, and turned into aliens. No yeah. Issue. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it is very much, isn't it? Because, like, yeah, everyone's got their, like, they're too far. Yeah. Anyway um my mother on the other hand was just like you guys do whatever the fuck you want I'm gonna bounce for like two hours <laughs> <laughs> so she has no time for horror films but at the same time she wants to watch them and she'll be like hey can you watch this with me during the day and again her two her two no's are The Exorcist and Jaws oh really Ooh. so she saw The Exorcist in the cinema and she was like no thank you <laughs> Um, I think she was 17 when she it bailed. Aired. Yeah, she was either, I think she was, no, she was 13. So she saw it when I was my age. Oh, that's nice. Um, and then Jaws, she saw in the cinema and she's never been in the ocean since. And she saw it when she was like very Really? Young. Yeah. yeah. Oh we went on a cruise a couple of years ago and I was like, mom, do you want to go in the ocean? She's like, no. <laughs> I was like, even up to your knees? She's no, like, no, that's where sharks get attack. me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Get She's me. like, I'm staying out of that shark's home. That is where that shark lives and I will respect that. <laughs> yep. Bless your mum. Yep. Why can't more people yeah. be like that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so much like my uh, segment for our forest episode uh, where I did the Blair Witch, um, The Exorcist has like a buck wild amount of publicity around its release. Mm-hmm. Like it was very much like the urban legend. And this is even way, this is way before the internet because the, uh, the Blair Witch was um, released around like the formative years of the internet. And so there was like a lot of like website um, stuff. Uh, Exorcist didn't have that. This is the seventies, mate. Uh, so the newspapers advertised it as the scariest movie ever made. <gasps> uh, you shouldn't see this film if you're pregnant or fragile or mentally vulnerable. <laughs> It was making people vomit in the aisles, pass out in their seats. It was making people crazy. There was one printing that was like, this film will mentally affect you. It will fuck you up. I feel like it was the sore of its time. (laughs) Yeah. And like humans are simple creatures. So like someone tells you not to do something, the impulse to do it grows. You're going to do it. So people flocked to this movie. They were just like, the lines were down the street. And New York Times called it, quote, A chunk of elegant occultist claptrap, a practically impossible film to sit through. It establish- establishes a new low for grotesque special effects. Love it. Mate, that's a fucking raving five star review uh, to me. Great. I see that yep. and I'm like, I'm there. Elegant occultist claptrap? Mate, sign me up. I'm into it. I want it. Yeah. When was like this? The Exist was yeah. 70... 70... 73? 73. Mid seventies, mid seventies. Yeah. A lot of yes. great horror came out in the seventies. Oh, oh yeah, dude. Oh, so, so that good. was the golden age, I think, of a lot of like genre defining films. Yeah, uh, I think Alien is seventy nine. And I think it from memory. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's like and Jaws came out this film two seventy one something like that. Mm. I think so. Yeah, Jaws was definitely seventies. Yeah. 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 I think the Omen I came out that at that recently. time. I've Rosemary's never seen it. Baby. Maybe Rosemary's Baby was it 60s. Did. Yes, I can't it did. remember. But it's so good. Yeah, that was. Oh, I thought the haircuts on the 60s. The cropped shorts, very lovely. Yeah. Um, And this film did wonders for the pea soup industry. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Heinz <laughs> made. <laughs> anyway, so we're going to tell you some uh, some little behind the scenes, some little BTS things. Um, BTS. So first up. Yes. Uh, the Demon. Uh, which is never credited or named, but is Pazuzu. Named Pazuzu <laughs> um, is a real entity of Mesopotamian belief. Um, the demon in the film was pl- played by Eileen Dietz, who was also Linda Blair's stunt double for Reagan. She did a lot of the, uh, she did the crab walk, the spider walk oh, down the stairs. I love it. So I used to yeah. be able to do that. You're fucking awful. And um, we wonder why I have spinal problems. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Look>. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Um, so throughout the film, if you've seen it, 
you'll know there's like this stark white fanged face it pops up like several times like just a blip in the footage like a and it's gone yep um it's never acknowledged in the film by the the characters and the rumor spread that the physical film reel of the movie was cursed and the demon was inside it and it could come out through the theater screen i love it that's amazing I love it. Yeah, mm-hmm. because it was just this little Easter egg popped in there and people were like, did you see that? See what? You didn't see it? Oh, my God. I've been chosen. Uh, Pazuzu is a demon that is said to prey upon the pregnant and the chi- and children, um, hence the warning against expected mothers seeing the film. Uh, that was, like, a big thing they played into. Um, so there was a trailer in circulation um, that had to be pulled due to the amount of seizures it caused. <gasps> um it's literally just um black and white flashing footage of the film but it's not black and white in the sense that the footage is black and white it's like the stark like white and black as if someone has like turned all the shadows and brightness up so it's just like it's like it looks animated but it's just like a footage effect um a bad time and of course people thought that was the work of a demon giving everyone uh, a seizure so like whatever <laughs> yep um, I love it. pope paul himself acknowledged the film <gasps> uh he was like oh yeah demonology is like super important we have to like study this shit again because of this film we need to know oh fuck yeah man. yeah well done. um which what kind of fucking publicity you can't buy that the pope was like the pope acknowledging your like catholic possession movie <laughs> like go off it's, it's like yes yes focus on the possession and not us raping kids yeah exactly. yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. real evil and that's a story for another episode uh <laughs> oh shit i don't know if we can go there man <laughs> no we can't <laughs> we'll leave that up to you at home uh <laughs> anyway so i would love to study demonology i remember when i was like 16 and going through that like what do i want to do with my life phase oh, i yeah. tried to find a demonology degree like i was like trawling the internet oh like, what shit school you were that kid de- oh my yeah. god that's amazing i know you i know you. zero results obviously <laughs> uh i almost went to school to work in the funeral industry too <laughs> i got like i got mortician on my job um job like thing quiz yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, I was like really into it. And then I realized you had to have a driver's license because there was a unit about like driving a hearse. And I was like, oh, I can't. Do that. <laughs> so, I still don't have it. <laughs> no. The correct. Potentially, I would have done it had I been able or could still drive, but I cannot. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, The Exorcist like notoriety was growing even before the film was released. There were like several deaths among the cast and crew. <gasps> during filming oh my god Um, really i didn't know this yeah so the actually plays reagan linda blair um her grandfather died during production Mm. um there was like a dude that was like assigned to keep the set really cold because there's a lot of scenes where like you can see everyone's breath because it's supposed to be freezing Mm. he died um a bunch of the crew members like family members died. A couple of crew members actually did die. Not with anything like to do with the film, like heart attacks and shit. They're just dying. But like, they're dying. People are dropping like flies. <sighs> um, and a lot of people like, after the film premiered, like died of heart attacks, but like, whatever. <laughs> probably, I have, a, I have a okay. theory. It's the fucking director. We'll get to him. Um, but the whole set caught fire at one point. And most of like the production was destroyed, um, except Reagan's bedroom, <gasps> which was completely untouched. Oh my god, that's fucked. Ooh, like, Is that not sus? So sus. That's so sus. Mm-hmm. I love it. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Um, so naturally, they brought a priest in to bless the set. Um, a real afterwards. one. Yeah, a real Yay. one. So that happened. Um, now the director, William Friedkin absolute hard ass this bitch ridiculous he needed to be on your list oh flora so no regard for safety for his actors and crew like everything was a death trap in the 70s yes and never was established the 60s the 50s the 40s everything (laughs) um so like i always associate that decade with like horrible accidents and negligence and murders and violence so there's a theme here 
So there's a scene where uh, Reagan's body spasms like uncontrollably while she's in bed, like screaming, like it's like she her body literally like flip flops back and forth. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I whip my yeah. hair back and forth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love that gif. <laughs> yeah. So Linda is attached to this like super dodgy looking apparatus that's like in the bed that um like makes her do that really like uncanny movement and it looks very ooky spooky. Mm-hmm. Um, well. Uh, during one of the takes, uh, she just starts screaming, like harder than like she has in any of the other takes. Like she's yelling, help me. She's screaming. <sighs> she's absolutely killing it. Yes, bitch. Oscar worthy. Turns out the acting was not what she was <gasps> doing. Um, the lacing on the harness had come loose and the machine was basically thrashing her about and just smacking her back. Oh my god. Um yeah, so her screams were real screams of pain and it fractured her Holy spine. Oh fuck, what? And they never sent her to the hospital. Oh what the fuck? Okay, no. Yeah. No. Cherry on top, that's the take they used in the film. This is Landis esque levels of bullshit. What yep. the fuck? Oh what did you say this director's name was again? I've forgotten already. Uh, Friedkin? William Friedkin. William Friedkin. <sighs> like, dude, this guy was absolutely cooked. Um, so Ellen Burstyn, who played Reagan's mother in the film, in one scene, um, she was she is thrown into she's thrown across the room. Yeah. In this take, she was thrown into the wall. Oh. Um, so they're in the scene, Reagan, it's in the masturbation scene. If you haven't seen the film. Oh, the scissors. Um, <gasps> yeah. Oh, is it, no, it's a crucifix. Oh, is it a crucifix? It's a crucifix. Oh, yeah. So it's a metal crucifix. If you haven't seen the film for those at home, uh, <laughs> Reagan, who is in the film, a 13 year old girl, um, is using, while she's possessed by the Pazuzu, a metal crucifix in which to masturbate with. And there is blood everywhere. <sighs> Absolutely everywhere. Um, and in that, and after that scene, she like assaults her mother, like she hits her. And um, Friedkin thought, hmm, that's not violent enough. <laughs> so he told the dude manning the like pulleys to just give it to her. He's like, yank it and yank it hard. So they did. Ellen not only flew backwards, she hit the wall of the set and smacked her head <gasps> so hard. And that is also uh, the shot they used in oh the film. Oh my God, Friedkin. And she starts like screaming and crying because she's smacked her head like on the the corner of a window. Holy cell. shit! Yeah. Um. He also used to uh, <laughs> um, shoot off a gun to like get people to actually be like like real <gasps> like reactions of them being scared. What the fuck? Yeah. Yeah, so that that's a thing. And he used to be like to Linda Blair, oh, I'm going to set it off so you can't jump because the demon wouldn't jump from a spoon. <gasps> so she had to like steal herself to be like, I can't jump at this. <laughs> um, yeah. What so, the fuck? What a fucking shit, terrible dude. person. <sighs> yeah. So shit, dude. Um, there's a scene in the film where Reagan re- receives an angiogram which is a procedure that allows doctors to take x-rays of your blood vessels. Um, a carteroid angiogram is uh, when they insert a very large, very fat catheter into your um, the crook of your elbow and inject you with a... Ca- cannula. Yeah, cannula. Catheter, you. no. <laughs> we don't no? want that going in there. Oh, that's the piss thing. Yeah, that's the piss thing. <laughs> yeah. The article I read about how it is done has a typo. <laughs> Uh-oh. But yes, it is a cannula. Okay. And yeah, just like that. So that scene's not, it's not a real procedure, but the people performing it are real doctors. So the, so the director was like, oh, this is cool as shit. Let's put this in the film. Uh, it's, they don't do that procedure anymore because it's like really dated. And the scene itself is like, probably the the scariest part of the film like th- that's the only part of the film that makes me kind of sometimes i have to turn away oh because it is such a big thing in being said into this little girl's arm and there is so much oh blood. my god it's really gross so they really did this um, to her no oh, it's staged but um it is praised by doctors for being the most medically accurate procedure in a film oh, yeah hmm. and they use it in like historical lectures to be like this is what we used to do because it looks so real oh my god he it's definitely really, cool. really did I... that to someone some poor fucking dude had to put his right. arm through a thing near reagan yeah. <laughs> and, like <laughs> do this to him 
Yeah. Um, so there is one technician in that scene. If you have seen the film, quiet dude, very lovely, very lovely bedside manner, apparently, because he was a real technician, uh, was complimented by parents of um, patients for his calming effect on their children. Hmm. Uh, this dude turned out to be a real life actual murderer. Oh, did he, he murder is. kids? No, oh. he murdered. He murdered gay men because oh. he was also a gay man, apparently. Um, so this man was called uh, Paul Bateson. And he was convicted of murder four years after The Exorcist premiered. Um, the body of uh, journalist Addison Verrill was found in his apartment. <gasps> um, cause of death, blunt force trauma and multiple stab wounds. Oh, my wounds. God. That's awful. So allegedly Paul and Addison had met in a gay bar called Badlands um, and shared a drink, which turned into several drinks, which turned into cocaine and nangs. Mm. Uh, poppers for our international listeners are uh, essentially inhalants. Um, they bar hopped for the rest of the night before going back to Paul's to have um, relations. All of the sex. <laughs> yes. Oh, so, dude, so much sex. Apparently until like seven in the morning. Huh. Um, yeah. So uh, Paul had turned to alcoholism after The Exorcist, though I believe the movie wasn't the cause of his addiction. Um, we hope. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Paul needed apparently needed money and decided in the moment to kill Addison, he brutalized uh, the man and stole $57 from him, oh which God. would equate to about $200 in today's Dude. money. Not enough not a lot to of kill money. somebody for. No. Um, so yeah, that's like just another one of the like, oh, by the way, real life murder in this film. Like it's just, this movie is so wild. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite films, as I've said, uh, big nostalgia boner for this film. And it's just so fun. <laughs> Up. I love it. It's so fucked it's up. <laughs> it's awful. Mm -hmm. I think knowing some of the stuff that happened uh, during filming makes it like more enjoyable. Yeah, as shitty as that sounds. Like, oh yes, yes, please. It's like when you watch um, um, now. Is it Poltergeist yeah. where they use real skeletons, real human skeletons in the pool scene? Oh, they super do. Is that the right movie? I think it is. Yeah. I think it's Poltergeist. Yes, yes, yes another seventies. They also used. Yeah, they used a real skeleton in the Pirates of the Caribbean, right? Oh, they did too. It's cheaper. Yes, <laughs> it is cheaper. Isn't that cool? It's fucked up. It's really it's interesting. Actually, anyway, one of my favorite real yes. life, like human remains used for entertainment purposes <laughs> stories is uh, <laughs> the Royal Shakespeare Company has a real skull for when they play <gasps> Hamlet. Yorick! Uh, yeah. So um, the guy willed his skull to <gasps> the company That's to be used. So cool. uh, yeah, so like um, all of the great Hamlets that have been playing in the Shakespeare Company have used that that skull. <gasps> um, like David Tennant, he when he played Hamlet, like it's very very cool. That's what so a great cool. legacy to have as well. That's really fucking cool. Well, I I I like that because someone's like, yeah, this is what I want to be done with yeah. my remains after yeah. I die. It's not like someone's just dug up a body and been like, this will do. <laughs> but is he credited in the playbill? I think he. But he's such a famous <laughs> skull. Yeah. I'm not sure. Oh, I love it. But yeah, he's like, make me a prop. Oh, I respect that. That's good. Yeah. Um, Turn me into an yeah. object. <laughs> All right. Well, in closing, as Laura has said, and I will say to you again, if you don't have a Shudder subscription, what the fuck are you doing? Um, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I have <laughs> no, so use many. My, use my account. I've got it Get a table. Shudder subscription. It's fine. You, I'll give you the login. <sighs> um, but like, why Loki is Shadow not sponsoring us for this episode? Thank you. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> like, watched Curse films. It's so good. The episode's like 30 minutes long. They cover everything, all the behind the scenes fun. It's really, there's some really iconic films on the list. And the fact that I didn't know that season two is coming, I'm like ready. I'm so excited. I'm really keen um, for it. Really, really keen. There's another good series on Shudder. Um, if you do like the Cursed films style, so like obviously a, a Mm -hmm. documentary and kind of thing there's another series that they do um which is about like different kinds of horror monsters Ooh. and different kinds of slashes I is that with eli called. roth is that it. history of horror yes it is eli roth's like house yep. of horror thing or something like that's that. very good and it's really yep. good i really enjoyed that yeah they've got a considerable amount of documentaries on there because they also have into darkness which is like a <gasps> film about yes. horror and they're making a sequel which is coming soon which is really cool um, so yeah, just get on it, my dudes. 
Do, do yourself a favor. Ella Ross History of Horror, excuse oh, me. Oh, I thought Fucking it was amazing. Of Horror, yeah. Really good. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I got like most of my content from that episode today because I was just like, I'm going to watch this episode eight times and write it down. Um, <laughs> but one thing I did like about the Exorcist episode is um, there's footage at the end of like real exorcisms. They get this priest on to yeah. do them. He has the most goth name I have ever heard. His name is, get this, Vincent Bauhaus. <gasps> oh, <laughs> amazing. Right? So good. Right? So good. I saw it and I was like, oh, fuck off. That's not his name. And that he's a Catholic so priest. Oh, totally yep. does. Yeah. And he does deem. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. It's Where's so the TV good. series about him? I want Mate. that. Mate. I love it's that. so good. Mate, shout out to Vincent. Mate, we love you. Father Bauhaus. Um, yeah, Father. Father, Father Bauhaus. Bauhaus. Mate, get yeah, get around it, mate. That That's the exorcist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very yes. good. That was great. Oh. Yeah. Well, that leaves one. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm doing, I'm, Okay, so when I was in boarding school, uh, when school ended, we'd run, run to the TV room to get the TV room first and put on whatever VHS would work in the thing. (laughs) Ones that did were uh, Haunting of Hill House, the OG one, where uh, you've got um, Liam Neeson, Owen Wilson, yeah, that kind of stuff, Catherine Zeta-Jones. Um, we had the full Jaws. We had the full I Know What You Did Last Summer. Um, we also had Scream. So I am naturally doing a Scream. Oh, yay. Did you yes. know this? <laughs> I know, but I forgot because I'm dumb. <laughs> um, it's just, it's such a, if you study film or are into film, it's such an important film in like the horror canon. Oh, it. It changed, it changed a lot of shit. So, um, 1996, so the big, the big dudes of the 70s, so you've got Alien, you've got The Exorcist, you've got that sort of stuff. The 80s you had Halloween and you had mm-hmm. uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Slasher years. Slasher years. But so those original films, they were good. They were cool beans. But then they just had a shitload of sequels that made no fucking sense. And then they had other people, like other films that were just doing just dumb slasher vibes. And basically horror got really corny and boring um, in the 90s. All of the stuff was straight to video. There was no like big premieres for, you know, horror films. And then Scream came along and changed it up for us. All right. Okay. So this fucking document i have lost three times so (laughs) i am just winging it um and then tay will have to edit it later cool all right (laughs) okay so of course uh the ghost face killer super 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 duper iconic oh my god my computer just died okay no (laughs) okay the curse segment of the fucking curse segment okay um, what I love about Scream is how it came about. <laughs> so um, Kevin Williamson, um, back in 1994, he was doing script writing at like um, like University of LA, like nothing amazing. Anyway, he was house sitting for some friends and he was watching. So the house wasn't his. It had a lot of windows. It was nighttime. And the Barbara Walters special on the Gainesville Ripper came up. And he started to get so spooked. And this is how Scream began. (laughs) Williamson states, quote, I was getting so spooked, I was being scared out of my mind. During the commercial break, I heard a noise and I had to go search the house. I went into the living room and noticed that the window was open. I'd been in the house two days and I'd never noticed the window open. So I got really scared. I went to the kitchen, grabbed a kitchen knife, got the portable phone and called a buddy of mine. Unquote. So Williamson then sort of systematically started checking the rooms while he was on the phone to his friend and holding the knife. 
<laughs> and he keeps going room to room and his friend is like, dude, you're being so fucking paranoid. What are you doing? You have to turn on the light before you go into a room. Like it's mm-hmm. like you've never seen a horror movie before. Don't you know the rules? And yeah. William's like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go outside and and check outside. And the guy's like, no, because the killer's gonna sneak in behind you. Like just freaking him out. <laughs> yeah. So after all this really supportive, uh, great stuff from his friend. <laughs> this is the kind of friend I am. Yeah, this is, yeah, just, this is, this is, this is a three way call with us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, when he finally went to bed, he had like horrific nightmares about being hunted by a killer with a knife. And oh he couldn't God. sleep anymore. He got up at 3 a.m. and wrote the first iconic opening scene. Oh, I love it. Guys. I love it. Yay, Mate, that's really cool. Write what you know. <laughs> write what you know. Let us discuss this opening scene. Yes, please. Oh, guys. Take us to school. They pulled a Hitchcock. It's so good. I'm ready to school the children. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. So, first of all, it features Drew Barrymore, who is just – I, f- I just, I love her so much. I think she's so great. So she was the first person signed on to Scream. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was going to play um, Sydney Prescott, the the main character, the final girl. And then she read it again. And she's like, oh, no, I should play Casey, the girl in the opening scene who dies within the first 12 minutes, 55 seconds. Drew Barrymore was very famous at this time. She was, she was very in demand. And even though Wes Craven, the director, was like, oh, I don't know how I feel about that. She's like, Drew Barrymore was like, no, remember Psycho, how yep. the main chick, she was the main chick and she died in the half an hour in the shower, mm-hmm. that like crazy scene. And it, it, fucked, it people. fucked people up. And she goes, if we do this, then everybody knows like anything is possible with this movie. So they led with that. And they also, so Nev Campbell um, who plays Sydney Prescott as we know her? Um, mm-hmm. She just come off the craft, so she was hyped, but still like kind of indie, right? Mm-hmm. Not as hyped as Drew Barrymore. Drew Barrymore has been working in the movie since she was five. ET was her first film. So all of the production put Drew Barrymore as the th- in the front. Well, her face is the face that we see on the cover. Yeah. And then the in the in like the nineties posters, you know how they're all sort of lined up, sort of Downton Abbey style, right? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> do you know what you guys know what I mean by that? Yes. <laughs> they always make sure that Drew is at the front. In the ads, it was all Drew going around the house with the phone. And so everybody going to the cinema was like, This is a Drew Barrymore movie. This is what we're doing. Which is amazing as well, because I hate the trailers tell you the whole fucking thing. I hate now. that so much. But that's sort of what what they did. So to keep her looking scared and crying, she would run around the set in between the takes um, until she was like hyperventilating and really like, you know, um, mm-hmm. while the director kept telling her real life like trigger stories about animal cruelty because she was such a big animal person. And um, for some people, when you say stuff bad about animals and how they die horribly, um, they cry, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Don't they? Look, I cry during all of this too when I tell you these stories. I have cried extensively while doing my notes. I just but yeah, that's from stress. You just share my pain. <laughs> does, does this make me real? So I don't like hearing about animal cruelty either. But as an ex-vegan who used to always be shown horrible slaughterhouse videos, I just have a stone face. You've been just here's the thing. I have. Here's it's the thing. Awful. I grew up on a farm, and I think animals are so precious. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I just can't do it, and my dad's the same. Like that's what's fucked up about it because on a farm, like you deal with animal death more frequently. Yeah, and they are sort of like usually not always, but usually like some form of food. Yeah, I feel like you you have a closer connection. You appreciate it. it's not the detachment of like mm, buying in the that's supermarket. True. Anyway, You've met your meal. Can I tell? Can, can I tell you a really cute story about my dad and animals? <laughs> you may. to soften yes. up the thing. Go on. So in two thousand and three, we had horrific horrific bushfires we were all going to be burnt out it was this was like we, were, we are going to lose our house we packed up our house you know that kind of thing mm-hmm. dad was um bulldozing part of the bush so that clearing the bush so that the fire couldn't jump across like basically a road and at, uh, he was like way up in the bush just trying to save as much land as he could and he noticed that there was a big wedge tail eagle nest huge it was like <gasps> the size of a room multiple trees oh my God. In the middle of the bush and he was like oh we need to save the eagles so he did not have time but he bulldozed around the eagle's nest so that they would have had a chance oh. 
Oh, come through dad. Come through dad. Did he check when he went back? They're, they were fine. <gasps> yeah. Oh, good so, you know, my dad is like that strong, silent, like Australian farmer type, but One he knows that bird's nest needs to be saved. <laughs> Oh, I, I love it. That's anyway, beautiful. back to the horror. Okay, mm-hmm. so uh, animal cruelty, Laura, excellent. We talked about that. Um, Am I in your notes? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm touched. So Drew Barrymore and even Nev Campbell didn't meet Roger Jackson, who was the actor who played the voice of Ghostface, um, ever. They, they think they met maybe in 2017 at like a horror con oh, wow. for the first really? time. And even the in f- between the set, like when, you know, they'd be on the phone to them, he'd either not talk to them, like in between the takes, or he would always use the voice when talking oh. to them. So like that's a voice he puts on. Yeah. So he would be sequestered in like a tent on set and have like a monitor sort of like uh, sort of seeing what the vibe was on set and where the cameras are going. Yep. So he could kind of like mark where he was. So that's everything. Um, actually, one point during uh, the scene, somebody forgot to unplug the phone when Drew Barrymore like goes like, I'm calling the police. And she like dials 911. 911 picked up and then we oh, heard no. <gasps> Drew Barrymore just screaming for her life on the phone. Oh, my God. Fuck, that's messed up. That sucks. You'd be so annoyed if you're in that proper pump and you're like, oh, no, what have I done? <laughs> and another thing, um, so she goes around. Um, so unfortunately, <laughs> this was being produced by uh, the Weinstein brothers. Oh. Bum, bow. Bum, bow, who believed that um, Drew Barrymore, so if you don't know, if you forget the film she's wearing, she's got a cute, a cute like, blonde bob on she's got a white sweater and jeans she's at home she's Mm -hmm. like being casual um he was like she should be in like a cute crop top and like high like short shorts and her hair should be different and she should be more boobs and the director was like no she's at home this is like she's not dressed up to be murdered like she's just at home chilling having yeah yeah making popcorn gonna watch a video (laughs) so (laughs) actually the popcorn uh, is a cool um, additive to the scene because it acts as a clock, doesn't it? So it goes oh, yeah. from like normal popcorn to out of control when the scene goes out of control. Mm. And you know oh, it, I love that. And you know it happens within like two to three minutes because that's how long popcorn takes to cook. Uh-huh. So you I can see it. like how so quickly it could just go from Over. normal to, you know, yeah. Oh, I hate that, but I love it. Yeah. Oh my god, I love that. What a good way to like mark time. <laughs> Holy shit, I love cinema. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> How cool is it? Um, and also like the house was chosen like to be like really modern, and have like all of those French windows, all of those French doors, which everyone loves. Which everyone I have loves. those in my house. I have mm-hmm. so many big windows mm-hmm. in my house. Guess what? Perfect ways to get murdered. Yeah. No Absolutely. curtains either. <laughs> um. So another thing that Scream is very different, apart from that crazy opening scene, bang, Drew Barrymore's dead, everybody doesn't know what to do. Brilliant. The movie is so self-aware. It is teens who know about horror movies who are living a horror movie. It is a very, very Mm -hmm. self-aware film. The references to other horror movies, I counted them. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I lost the fucking document. (laughs) <laughs> and the number. I'm gonna just name you all the films that references. Ready? Oh yes, please. Yeah. Nightmare in Elm Street, Halloween. They're the big ones. That is because yeah. Wes Craven worked on both of those films. I love mm-hmm. Wes Craven just quietly. Psycho, mm, right. the thing yeah. with two heads. Dementia Thirteen, The Night of the Living Dead, The Town That Dreaded Sundown, The Howling, oh, Prom right. Night, Everyone's All American, Candyman, Frankenstein, Evil Dead, Hellraiser, The Fog, Terror Train, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Exorcist, Gremlins. <laughs> <laughs> the Exorcist. So many. Good the Exorcist films. actually plays a big plot point because that's when her boyfriend climbs through the window. And he's like, I was watching The Exorcist on TV, but. 
they cut out all the good shit and we should get some PG-13 on right now. And she's like, oh. Oh, yeah. I'll show you, I'll show you my tits. Cool beans. Um, basic instinct. Fr- Friday the 13th. All the right moves. Clueless. They're not like, but they would have been fine. Signs of the Lance. <laughs> Um, I spit on your grave. Bad oh. seed, smoking clerks. So, oh, so God. many. What is this movie from? I spit on your garage. Like, just <laughs> sarcastic teenager shit. It's so fantastic. Um, they even do, like, Randy, who's the guy he is. He works at Blockbuster, and he knows all the horror movies. Like, these are the rules, guys. You're not go- you don't never have a sex. Never do drink. Like, never do drugs. Never drink. And never say, like, I'll be right back or, like, hello or who's there, <laughs> like, all those things. And up until, like, that point, the the people who drink and do drugs, they must be punished in film, so they must die. Yep. So that's why, like, um, that's why they all do that. But the thing is, Sydney Prescott is different because she does have sex. She does drink, but she's not punished for those things. Whereas, like, you know, Jamie Lee in Halloween, she was virginal. She never did any of that sort of stuff. And she was basically, like, yep. she is pure, so she gets a pass, even though Mike Myers is, like, trying to kill her. Things like that. So um, I can't not talk about the costume. Oh, yes. So uh, Wes Craven, the director, he f- discovered the ghost face mask while <laughs> on a filming location in a child's bedroom. Um. <gasps> He was walking through it and he's like, oh, my God, fuck yeah, this mask is amazing. He sent the picture to the prop department at Dimension Films and he was like, can we make a mask similar? Like, let's rip this off, but, like, not rip, like, not, you know, rip it off to the point where we get sued. Um, and they were like, yeah, cool, we can do that. So they made the mask. Its eyes are uh, bigger. It has a bigger nose and the mouth is longer and a bit different. So they filmed this with this mask and then, Halfway through, I think maybe the first couple of weeks of filming, they got the rights to the original mask. So the mask actually changes in the film. Oh, there's two really? masks. Yeah, I've never noticed that. Mm. Yeah, that's because oh they ripped off so well. So the mask is, of course, based on uh, the Scream by Edvard Munch. Um, you know, the, which we have talked about in another episode where we were talking about, I think it volcanoes. Was again, it was me. With, yeah, 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 exactly. With the changing of the sunset. Ah, oh, you listen. So good. I listened. <laughs> so, and that's also, um, so Scream was originally called, of course, Scary Movie. Oh, <gasps> no way. I love Scary Movie. It was movie. really. I, every time I try to remember Scream, I get love a lot scary of Scary Movie, movie <laughs> moments mixed up in my head. Mm-hmm. When they get stoned. <laughs> Yes. Oh my god! What's that? And what also, that? do you know that stoner, Most the stoner stupid. ghost face mask is like you can buy it. It's like a Halloween costume. I want that. Oh, um, <laughs> and I always think of Doofy instead of Dewey. Dewey. As, oh like, god! The um, sheriff. Else, well as yeah, I love it. Um, so they took Scary Movie, but it was renamed Scream by the Weinstein's because of um, the Michael Jackson. Um, song uh, scream oh yeah that was really right. popular at that time and yep, so they yep, kind yep. of did it on that scary movie would have worked better but the wayne brothers got that and that was fun all can i just say yeah. though also side mm. note um skeet ulrich and matthew lillard were so good looking in this film. oh my <laughs> god i knew no. oh I, my god and my favorite scene is always gonna be rose mcgowan trying to fit through that fucking do you know what kit do you know what <laughs> they'd film that scene and she could fit through it fucking easily and the prop department had to make it narrower make so it she smaller. couldn't that bloody 90s heroin chic look fucker she could yeah. fit through it easily oh. and they were like oh shit okay <laughs> because she I was too tiny I can't um, even fit my fucking big ass forehead through it. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, the robe of Ghostface was meant to be white, mm-hmm. like an actual ghost. Oh. But then, when when they put it all together, they were like, "He looks like he's like going to a Ku Klux Klan meeting. We can't do this." Oh, yeah. of course, that's yeah, fair. that's fucked. And they were like, "Black, black is good, perfect." Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, cool. So, filming took place over eight weeks, which is not a lot of time. For no, a no, no. Um, very quick and there was one scene uh, it was the final night like during the party scene where it ran so it's a 42 minutes of just that night 
on the thing. So it took 21 days to film just that one night. Holy and they shit. the crew got T-shirts saying, I survived scene 118. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this was uh, the scene where Courtney uh, – this was the movie that Courtney Cox and David Arquette got together. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah, um, oh. Courtney Cox – Applied for this, uh, applied to be um, the weather, not the weather bitch, the reporter bitch, uh, saying mm-hmm. like she, she was in like her third or fourth um, season of Friends and she was like, I want to be a hard-hitting like cunt bitch woman. And he was like, yeah. I have the role for you. Um, <laughs> and they gave her those fucking bangs. They gave her those oh fucking bangs. Oh, <laughs> the scariest part of that franchise. <laughs> <laughs> um. Now, the final cut of – so it took two months to edit, which is a long time considering Wes did it himself. Oh, shit. Yep. So there were several problematic scenes that they had to cut because they wanted to get basically like an M15 rating rather than an R18 rating. Ah. Right. Um, So one of the scenes was like a close-up of Rose McGowan Tatum's head getting squashed in the pet flap vibe. (gasps) Mm, oh no that couldn't happen um also um the gutting death of like Stephen orth which is casey becker's boyfriend in the first scene um when he's on the the deck chair and he's like if you Uh, don't answer this correctly then you know the movie trivia you know you're fucked i'll kill him um they literally had a like he was like on the thing and he dies and then his organs fall out of his body and the and the ratings guys were like fuck no we cannot do that (laughs) absolutely not and also uh kenny which is the cameraman um when he got his throat cut um which it was fine like the throat cutting was um was good and fine for ratings i don't know yeah but allow it (laughs) but the ratings people were like the actor's face is way too disturbing and we can't do it Oh, so they actually come just through. an amazing job, and they were like, "Oh fuck, no, we cannot. We don't like we that. We do That's not too like upsetting. that." What so, a compliment to your abilities to be like, "Oh, your face." Yep. No, no, no. Fucked the whole film. We can't put it in. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Too scary. Yeah. Too scary. And um, they, they were like, "No, no, 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 never." Um, now it is also the rare, uh, like a quite a rare slasher franchise where the original director directed every movie in the franchise, and that still hasn't happened again. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. I was sure that the later ones were directed by someone else. Holy shit! Mm-hmm. That's so cool. So um, another thing about Scream. So it refreshed the horror of the nineties. We wanted smart people. We wanted it to be funny. We wanted a roller coaster ride, and it started all those good films up again. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after, actually after 9-11, that's when horror changed and we wanted something a bit more different. We wanted something a bit more patriotic. So war movies became the absolute vibe. Right. Yes. And then horror, of course, you know, did a different cycle and changed again to like the found footage. Yes. So starting from Blair Witch, we then get paranormal activity, blah, 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 16, 17, 18, whatever they're up to, um, <laughs> Cloverfield, that kind of stuff. And then we're getting into like gore, which is like Saw and the other one that was really disturbing. Hostel. Yeah. Hostel. Oh, God. Yeah. Hostel. I watched that far too young as well. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember the scythe scene above the oh, bath. It's beautiful, though. What a mm-hmm. scene. Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. the sound. Good folly. Now, um, mm-hmm. after Scream debuted, uh, there were a couple of copycat murders. <gasps> yes, there really? were. So. What? Yeah. Oh, yes, bitch. So January 1998, so remember Scream came out in 96, 16-year-old mm. Mario Padilla and his 14-year-old cousin Samuel Ramirez, unfortunate last name, stabbed mm. Mario's mother. 40 times, 45 times killing her. This became known as the Scream murder because the boys said that they were inspired by Scream and, like, the movies. And Jesus Christ. uh, The pair confessed um, that they were trying to buy two Ghostface costumes and a voice changer, you know, like the characters use in the films. Um, Mm. And they were sort of like they were kind of using the – uh, movie as a blueprint 
Um, and there was like outrage. No oh, shit. Another one, which was done in 1999, 13 year old Ashley Murray was stabbed uh, multiple times in her head and back before being left for dead by his friends, Daniel Gillett and Robert Fuller, both 14 and 15 respectively. Um, he was saved uh, by uh, an elderly man who was walking his dog and called the, called the ambulance. Mm. Um, they blamed uh, they blamed Scream and that was fine apparently. Um, another one in 2002, a 17-year-old boy lured his friend, 15-year-old Alice uh, Beaupair, out of her parents' house. In, this is in France though. Stabbed her 42 times while wearing the ghost face mask. Um, he wanted to emulate the killer. He blamed Scream. And then following the Columbine massacre in 1999, when the US was like, video games and horror movies are making our kids super violent and Scream, um, the opening scene of Scream was played in court for people to see the violence of Scream. Oh, my Jesus God. Christ. That's what wild. Fuck? Thinking about, like, how tame that film is in so many ways now. Yeah. It's really yeah. fucked. <laughs> um, I keep thinking, like, people who blame the movies for why they, you know, why they do, like, really horrific shit. I mean, like those girls who are like, we did it for Slender Man. We killed our friend yeah. for Slender Man. Yeah, right. It's like, ugh. It, they're at that age, that 13, 14, 15, where they're so impressionable. And guess what? Those movies aren't made for them. No, they're rating. They're are, rating probably, you know, um, not saying that I wasn't fucking watching those movies then, but, <sighs> no, um, you know, they don't have any concept of the outside world yet. Yeah. You know. Um, I turned out also, fine. Um, we all <laughs> anyway, turned yeah, out exactly. fine. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, but we watched it and we didn't murder people, so there's something else, <laughs> you know? Um, now, finally, <laughs> in closing, I would like to just do a quick, you know, paragraph or two about uh, the Gainesville Ripper who inspired Kevin Williamson. Yes, please. Oh, There yes. is lots of um, similarities to Scream. Okay, I will oblige. There we go. So Gainesville murders took place 1990 in a college town of Gainesville, Florida. This is one of those college towns that doubles in size during the school year. I think there's three colleges in that one town, right? Wow. So over a three-day period, um, the Ripper took the lives of five college students and created an absolute frenzied panic. This was a small Mm -hmm. town where the police are like, we arrest underage drinking and maybe some drug use, maybe car crash. Four times a year. Like, that's what we're doing. Fuck. So on August 24th, the Ripper um, murdered Christina Powell, 17, and Sonia Larson, 18. Um, he stabbed them in their own home. Uh, he broke in and killed them and then mutilated their bodies and then posed them mm. oh. in really, it, like, really fucked positions. Um the next one uh, was on Krista Hoyt. After killing her, he could, he de- he decapitated her, put her head on a shelf, and then posed her body so that it was sitting upright on the end of her bed. Oh, oh God. that's chilling! Oh, my tummy just did like a little drop. Oh, that's gross! Mm. And like oh. he, and like he gut them and everything. It was always knives, and there was always like posing and like really really intense violence. Um, so. Everybody is panicking. People, like, there is so much phone, like, people trying to call out, people trying to call in. It's the 90s. The phone lines are down. They can't handle Mm. it. People are trying to call home. People are leaving home. Um, The college is shut down and they say, you know, stay together. There's curfews. There's um, there's everything. Students gather together to, like, you know, sleep in shifts in the same um, apartment. Um, like just like in Scream, there was movie cameras, like there was cameras everywhere from reporters doing like the man on the street thing, which is quite similar to how like Scream is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They love a sexy killer. I think the most uh, heartbreaking one was 23-year-old uh, students 
Emmanuel Taboda and Tracy Pauls. Now they were mates. Um, Tracy asked Manuel to come over because he was a big, muscly footballer dude. Brick shit house. Brick shit house. Mm-hmm. And she was like, um, you know, none, they couldn't afford to leave and go home. Oh, gosh. So she's like, come over, you know, nobody's going to fucking deal with you. You were so big and so muscly. And um, he was there to protect her and their bodies were found the next morning. Oh, my God. Holy shit. He had put up a fucking fight. But when somebody comes at you with a knife and you're half asleep. Yeah. Um, There's not much he can do do. again there. Can't blame him. Fuck. Yeah. So um, that that's that's big. And the party at in Scream was because everybody was staying together. Yeah. So there's that. Um, The murderer. I'm not even going to say his name because fuck him. Fuck Fuck him. him. Do you know why he did it? He did it to be famous. (gasps) Oh, he did it to be famous. Um, Ted Bundy had been killed by lethal, in- no, not lethal injection. He'd been electrocuted, uh, the year before. And he was like, oh, I'm going to be famous. Like Ted Bundy. He even went for like petite, pretty brunettes. Oh, and, um, like, he pleaded guilty so to all five murders, even though that meant that he was up for the death penalty, which he got because he didn't want to see the crime scene photos in court. <sighs> he was Fucking there. Fry. He did that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, what? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So uh, he was put to death by lethal injection in 2006. And guess what? Good. If you want to know more about him in Strange Romances, uh, he features. He married a, well, not married, got together with a true crime author who had no scruples and was like, let's make money <gasps> out of your <gasps> fucking weirdness. Yeah. Oh my God. I forgot about that. <sighs> cool. So. Uh, mm. that was Scream. Thank you. Thank you very much. Holy shit. Yeah. What an excellent episode. Mate, we've got to revisit this one, mate. I've already thought of like three other films that I want to do. Yeah, no, same. <laughs> I'm, I'm into I it. Just, I just want to watch movies. I don't want to be an adult. I don't want to do school. I don't want to do school. I want to watch movies. Oh. Mm, I don't want to teach children. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, who gave me a job instructing students, teenage students? What the? What the you're fuck? a capable bitch. Mm. Fuck it up. I'm going to ruin some lives. Some <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your patience, listeners. Um, we have been gone a hot minute, but we are back. Um, and we miss you. We missed you. We're we missed you. How are you? Are you okay? How are you doing? Tell us about yourself. We love you. Um, as always, you can find all the extras at weirdsisterspodcast.com. All of our socials are on there. Um, uh, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Leave us a nice comment on our Facebook page. We love it. Um, we, we love do. to see it. Uh, got a topic you'd like to hear, mate, chuck us a cheeky DM or even an email. All, as again, all the info's on the website. We eventually um, get around to them. <laughs> yeah, love to hear from you. Um, and with that... I think we can Thanks. sign off. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.